thanks for coming to EME Grad Preview. Um, we uh, preview program. Uh, this is our first presentation, and we're really excited to have you guys here. Uh, so, with that, I will let Elena and Hannah uh, go ahead and kick us off with our first presentation. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Elena, and I use she, her pronouns. Hi, I'm Hannah. I also use she, her pronouns. And today we're gonna to be talking about the basic nuts and bolts of how grad school works. So this series is facilitated by a group of PhD students at UC Davis in the population biology program. You will see them on this call along with some other grad students and postdocs who will be serving as your individual mentors. So, uh, I don't know if we can have people wave. Are people able to see everyone or is it just the speaker? I can only see one person. Usually we have them wave. Later on, you'll see them. <laughs> okay, so today is our first of five informational sessions held on Tuesdays and we also have workshops and office hours on Thursdays. So office hours are just time for folks to come and ask us any additional questions you have or just get to know us and your fellow participants. And it's super casual. You can drop in at any time and for however long you'd like. Um, all of our sessions are 5 to 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. Our first workshop is on personal and diversity statements. And our second one is going to be a panel discussion with folks answering questions about what it's like to navigate grad school as an international student, member of the LGBTQIA community or person of color. Um, and we would actually like to do a poll now to ask who plans to attend this Thursday's workshop on personal and diversity statements. So if we could get that poll going, um, just let us know if you plan on coming so we can get a tentative head count. And that is two days from today. Give Felix a few more seconds to respond. I know some people just got in from the waiting room. So if you're planning on coming to the workshop this Thursday, please click yes on this poll or no if you can't make it. We have a few more people we're waiting on. <laughs> All right, we'll give you a few more seconds. This workshop will be recorded and posted online. Yes. Okay. Looks like 32 people, 33 say they can come. Great. I'll have to remember that. Maybe we can write it down. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. Okay. So this is a 90 minute session, which means that we will provide you with a solid foundation in the topics we discuss, but it is by no means exhaustive. So we will be providing you with resources if you want to dig deeper. Um, also, all the facilitators that are here are either grad students or postdocs. So we have thought a lot about these topics and we're a couple years ahead of some of you, but we are by no means experts. Um, we're just here to help guide your discovery and we value your contributions because we are here to learn from each other. In this workshop, we would appreciate if you would keep your video on. Um, the vast majority of communication we use as humans is nonverbal, so it helps us a lot as facilitators um, when we can see how you're reacting to us. Of course, we understand there's some circumstances that don't allow for that. So if you need to keep it off, that's also okay. Um, we'd also appreciate if you would stay muted unless you're speaking. Um, if you have a question or comment during this session, please don't hesitate to raise your virtual hand um, or just type it in the chat. Um, we are, got a bunch of folks answering questions in the chat, so happy to take questions there. Um, and if you have a question, it's very likely that other people have the same question. Um, so please do ask it. We hope to make this session as interactive as possible. And lastly, we hope that you'll um, be respectful and curious. Um, some of this may be review for some of you and certain parts may be more or less relevant, but just please keep in mind that everyone's coming to this workshop with different experiences and we're um, trying to support everyone. All right, so we hope that by the end of this session, 
you will be able to understand the structure of a graduate program, differentiate between different types of graduate programs, and use our framework to start making decisions about whether you want to pursue grad school or not. And to start, we'd like you to take a moment to identify uh, one question or concern you have about grad school. Um, this could be anything, maybe something you're worried about, like finances or just fitting in, or even if grad school is right for you. Um, so take a moment to think about a question or concern that you have. And what we're going to do now is place you into breakout rooms um, with a couple peers and a mentor or two. Um, and when you get into this breakout room, we'd like you to start by introducing yourself. So what's your name? Um, maybe where do you go to school or where do you currently work? And what are you interested in studying? And then um, if you're comfortable, please share that question or concern you just thought of with your group. Um, mentors, we'd like you to also introduce yourselves and share a concern you had when you were applying to grad school um, as well. Okay. different types. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of graduate programs. Um, we're curious about your prior knowledge. So if you want to pursue graduate school in ecology and evolution, that means applying to either PhDs or master's programs. What do you think are some of the differences between PhD and master's programs? Go ahead and post some ideas in the chat. How do PhDs and master's programs differ? What do you think? Good, I'm starting to see some ideas come in. So length of time it takes to complete, um, PhD is longer and more intense, timeline, the depth of the research project, um, PhD is more independent and research-based, different opportunities, length and duration, um, thesis versus dissertation, funding, um, what kind of careers you can have, uh, what, how much you publish, whether they're funded, yeah, these are all really good um, ideas. So I wanna preface this by saying that I have a master's degree and I thought it was a really valuable experience, but um, not everybody goes that route. Some people go straight to the PhD. So here are some of the main differences that we outlined um, thinking about master's versus PhDs. Um, in terms of length, PhDs are generally longer. So usually you're looking at five to seven years, whereas a master's is typically two to three. Um, there's exceptions in both cases. Some people take even longer to do a master's and some people do a PhD in four years, but this is kind of what you can expect. Um, in terms of depth, PhDs require more depth um, in terms of the type of projects and the scholarly research that's expected of you. Um, in terms of funding in the US, you're generally paid to do a PhD. So it's like a job that covers your tuition, healthcare and living expenses. Um, while master's programs often require that you pay the school for your tuition and healthcare, and you're usually expected to have money to cover your own living expenses. Um, there are some master's programs that will pay you, but um, they're generally uh, more rare than ones where you have to pay your own way. Uh, in terms of prestige, PhDs are considered more prestigious, and what I mean by prestige is just your level of expertise, which can affect uh, the jobs you're considered qualified for. So there's some jobs, for example, like being a professor at a research university or certain industry positions that require a PhD. Um, but for other jobs, for example, teaching at a community college, um, a PhD might just be preferred, but it's actually optional. You can teach at a community college with just a master's. Um, there are other jobs that require only require a master's or a bachelor's degree, and having a PhD might actually make you considered overqualified for that position. Um, title upon completion, when you finish a PhD, you get to add a doctor before your name. Um, I was very disappointed to find out when you finish a master's, you don't get a title. But if you want to walk around calling yourself a master, that's totally fine. Um, okay, so... Now we're gonna talk about the paths to grad school. Two of the most common paths are to um, either do a master's degree first and then go into a PhD or to skip the master's degree altogether and go into a PhD program from college or maybe after working a couple of years. Um, there's some other paths though that you should be aware of. So 
In some master's programs, um, sometime early, in, usually in your second year, you can apply to do a PhD in the same lab um, program in school. Um, so like you're admitted as a master's student and you decide, actually, I wanna stay longer and you turn that into a PhD. Um, after you finish the master's, uh, you get the degree awarded with the usual pomp and circumstance. You get to walk and everything, and then you launch straight into the PhD. Um, in these cases, the coursework that you did for your master's is usually transferred over and counted um, as part of the requirements for your doctorate. So that's kind of one advantage. Um, another path in some cases, uh, you can concurrently pursue a master's and a doctorate by having the master's degree awarded um, in passing. Um, that's what in passing means, just in passing. So, for example, um, at UC Davis in the program that we're in, um, if you're pursuing a PhD, once you fulfill a certain number of requirements, like you pass your preliminary exams, um, you can be awarded a master's. Um, there's no none of the fanfare. You don't get to walk or anything, but you do get a piece of paper that says now you have a master's. Um, lastly, some students decide to drop out midway through their PhD program, um, and if you've completed a sufficient amount of work, like, for example, finished all the required classes, they might give you a master's degree instead. Um, this is called mastering out. Um, so that's another way to obtain a master's. Um, besides considering master's versus PhD programs, there are some other choices that you have to make about the type of programs you want to apply for. So there are programs in the US, these are domestic programs, um, but there's also a lot of programs abroad, for example, in Europe, Australia, Canada. Um, in the US, you can generally go straight from college or working to a PhD, there's no master's degree required, um, but this is not the same internationally. So a lot of international PhD programs um, require that you have completed a master's first. So just something to be aware of. Um, PhD programs are also generally shorter abroad. Um, this is partially because many of these programs, like I already mentioned, require a master's degree first, and partially because there's also a lot less emphasis on developing your own questions and projects. So generally, if you do a PhD abroad, you're often um, joining an already existing project. Um, and that process of like coming up with your own questions can take one to two years. So that's why PhDs tend to be longer in the US. Um, one thing you have to be really careful about if you're applying to programs abroad is funding. So a lot of PhD programs abroad are funded by their national governments. Um, so like a PhD in Australia would be funded by the Australian government, which often means that only citizens of that country are eligible for funding. And you should never do a PhD you have to pay for. They should be paying you. So just keep in mind, um, think about funding if you're thinking about international PhDs. Um, if you're considering master's programs, another distinction you should be aware of is that there's both thesis-based and non-thesis-based master programs. Um, non-thesis-based programs, also called professional master's programs, are generally shorter with a focus on completing classwork and projects. This is kind of like an extension of undergrad. Um, thesis-based programs are more like a mini PhD. They're generally longer because they require you to conduct research and write up your results as a thesis. Um, finally, you should be aware that some programs operate on a rotation system while others do not. Um, rotations are really common in PhD programs in some fields like genetics and microbiology. Um, they tend to be more rare in the fields of ecology and evolution, but there are exceptions. I think Yale, for example, has rotations. Um, when there are research rotations, you apply to the program and try out two to three different labs, usually like one per quarter or one per semester or whatever, um, before deciding which one you want to join. Um, most programs in ecology and evolution are not rotation based. So you apply to a specific lab, um, an advisor, or maybe two if you want to be co-advised. So you're going to know who you'll be working with from day one. Um, the focus of this presentation and the rest of the workshop series is on PhD programs in ecology and evolution in the US uh, without rotations where you prepare a thesis or dissertation. So we'll talk a little bit about um, master's programs and some other things, but in general, we're focusing on PhD programs in ecology and evolution in the US uh, without rotations.
Okay, that was a lot of information. So I want to pause here just to see if there's any questions at this point. Um, you can uh, raise your hand or go ahead and post in the chat. And we'll be happy to take your questions if you have any. They teach you when you want to become a teacher that you have to wait like an awkwardly long amount of time. People actually think of their questions and type them. So I'm just going to give it a few more moments to see if there's any questions. Yeah, I see a raised hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I just had a quick question um, about professional versus thesis master's programs. Um, if you were to obtain either one of those and say apply for a job that requires a master's, would both of those consider you eligible? Would it depend on the position or do they prefer like a thesis based master's? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think most places, if they just say master's required, they just want you to have a master's. Um, I know it does matter uh, sometimes applying to grad school. So like if you're trying to get into a PhD program, they generally want someone who has research experience, um, which comes, you do a lot more research if you do a thesis based, but I know plenty of people who have done professional masters and gone on to jobs or to PhDs. Um, so yeah, I think, I think either path works. Hannah, Thank you so does, much. does it matter if the jobs require doing research? Do you know? Uh, it doesn't matter. So like if you're applying for a job where you'd be doing research, does it matter if you have? Oh, that's that's business? a good point. So if you're applying, for example, to be like um, a lab technician, um, they might want you to have research experience. But um, I know at least for some professional masters, you still have to conduct like a project and that can be research. So it doesn't exclude you um, from having research experience. I think in general, that would be a really good question for um, potential employers or labs you're interested in joining. Um, I would just reach out and ask, like, you know, is there a certain type of master's you're looking for? Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions at this point in time? No? All right, then we'll keep going. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is the daily experience of a grad student. So, um, oh, actually, sorry, I do see a question in the chat. What proportion of the mentors had a master's prior to entering the program? Good question. Um, I did a master's before starting a PhD, but I think most in my cohort did not have a master's. Is there anyone else on the call who did a master's? I also did mine, but... Um, I was the only one in my cohort of nine who did. I also did mine, but I too am the only one in my cohort of four who did. I did as well, and I'm one of two in my cohort of eight that has one. I think um, the cohort, my cohort in the GGE has at least four or five people who have masters, but we're also a larger group. Great. Thanks, everybody, for chiming in. So um, many of you are already involved in research, at least in some capacity. And doing research as a PhD student involves um, surveying the literature, uh, designing a project, applying for funding, usually funding for your research. Again, um, you shouldn't be applying for funding uh, for tuition or your living expenses. Um, collecting data, analyzing that data, and then publishing papers. Um, research comes in three main flavors uh, in ecology and evolution. So there's theoretical research. This is uh, computer-based analytical studies, including um, constructing models and simulations. There are um, lab-based research projects. So this could be indoor experiments using model or non-model organisms, um, including agricultural, uh, behavioral, genetic, microbial, or physiological studies. 
And then finally, there's field-based research. So this is empirical or observational work examining nature in a natural field setting or mesocosms, um, which are basically like greenhouses or aquariums that mimic um, nature. So we're curious to get to know you a little better. Do you feel like you are primarily interested in theoretical work, uh, lab work, field work, or some combination of the above? So go ahead and let us know. And if you're not sure, that's totally okay too. Whatever you're feeling at this moment, um, go ahead and put that into the poll. Okay, I see we're about at um, 82 percent completion. So I'll give you five more seconds to put it in a response. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's take a look. Wow, so nobody here is interested in theoretical research. That's interesting. Uh, we have a couple of folks who put lab work, um, uh, more folks who chose field work, and a lot of you um, chose some blend of the above. Um, so like many of you indicated D on that poll, um, many PhD students do some combination of the above. Um, you don't have to choose just one flavor. And a lot of people actually choose what flavor after they've already started the program and start taking classes and they're like, hey, actually this theoretical stuff is kind of cool. And um, I don't have to wake up super early to sample during tides if I do computer simulation. So just something to consider. Um, so there are um, some different risks and rewards, trade-offs associated with each of these. So for example, if your PhD is based on seasonal field work, it might take you longer to finish than someone who's doing all theory um, because they're not limited by field seasons. Um, when choosing a program or a project or an advisor, you should really think about what kinds of things you want to do long term. So, for example, do you want to spend a lot of time outside climbing mountains, bent over in a greenhouse, staring at your computer screen? Um, these are the kinds of things you should think about when choosing a project program and advisor. Um, a PhD is really a full time job. Um, we'll contrast how PhDs differ from a traditional nine to five in a couple of minutes, but here are some of the components that could be a part of your PhD. Um, first and foremost, research. This must include projects that you lead, but many students are also involved in collaborations with other grad students, postdocs, and or professors, um, sometimes at different institutions. Um, most PhD students teach unless they have other means of financial support. Um, a lot of PhD students mentor undergrads or younger grad students in their lab. Um, being a PhD student also involves going to conferences and attending workshops. Um, they could be specific to your research or they could be on other topics like teaching or equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, many PhD students are involved in some type of service and this can take a lot of different forms. Um, so for example, at UC Davis, there's a graduate student association. I think most schools have that. Um, you might be on different committees related to, um, for example, revising the curriculum or picking, you know, what speakers come to talk in your seminar series. Um, there's a ton of grad student activists. So, um, for example, at UC Davis, grad students just formed a grad student uh, union, which is pretty cool. Um, there's a ton of outreach opportunities. So in my free time, I um, help run an after-school science club for middle school students, which is a lot of fun. There's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, um, science communication, advocacy, so a lot of different service opportunities. Um, finally, many PhD students have passions outside of science, like hiking or baking or doing improv. Um, some of us also have important non-academic pursuits, such as taking care of kids or parents. So next we're gonna talk about the structure of a graduate program. And we just talked about some of the things we'll do during a PhD, but we wanna zoom out and talk a bit about the structure of a PhD program within a university. Um, so using UC Davis as an example, you start at the top with the university and within the university, there may be colleges or schools like the College of Biological Sciences or Agriculture. 
And within colleges here are departments like evolution and ecology and plant sciences. And within departments, we have labs run by principal investigators. And at UC Davis, the graduate groups are not specific to one department. So instead they're interdisciplinary groups that stretch across departments and colleges. Um, so for example, if you're in population biology, you could be in a lab housed in the evolution and ecology department or in the plant sciences department. So that's that yellow smiley face. Um, likewise, in a particular lab, you might have lab mates from your graduate group or others. Um, so how is this relevant for deciding on a graduate program? There's going to be more on that in a future session, but um, whereas in undergrad you focus on the school and the department or major uh, to choose where you want to go, in grad school the PI, grad group, and department are more important than the school in terms of prestige, connections, and what is going to impact your day-to-day -day experience. Uh, and this example is obviously specific to UC Davis, but we wanted to emphasize that when you're applying to grad school, it will be important to understand the structure beforehand, um, because which lab, grad group, department, or college you end up in will shape your entire experience, like what classes you take, the values and culture of the group you interact with, where your funding comes from, and how much of it is available to you, and other important considerations you may want to take into account. Um, there's a question in the chat. Do you have any advice on reaching out to PIs or advisors when applying to grad school? Um, so we'll we'll cover that and we'll provide you with some example templates of emails you want to send. Um, I think my advice, and we should have some input from a few other folks as well, would be to <clears throat> be specific in your um, request to people. So talk about yourself and your interests and be honest about them and try to connect that to specifically what that PI is working on in some way. So you might want to mention a project that they're working on or a paper that they've written that kind of aligns with your interests. You might want to mention um, some research you've done, maybe an honors thesis um, or maybe you're writing a grant proposal and you have a proposed project. Um, so I would say specificity is key. And um, the more that you include that pertains specifically to you and to that advisor, I think the better it'll come across. We have a few more questions, but does anyone have any other advice on reaching out to PIs? Um. I would say also be specific, like say I am applying to graduate school this year and I'm interested in joining your lab. Like don't beat around the bush. If they don't, or if they're not taking students, like don't waste your time with them. They'll write back and say, sorry, not taking students and you move on. And like, I also attached a CV with mine. Um, and if you, especially if this person may know any of your undergrad advisors, like say who you're working with um, so that they are like, oh yes, I know that person. Like if I read a recommendation from them, like that's a good sign. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and again, we're gonna have a lot more advice on this in a future session. Um, another question I see is elaborating more on what the grad groups are and what they're for. Um, so I don't know how often grad groups are a system used at other schools, um, but at UC Davis, I think the point is to try to foster connections between different departments um, and just get people talking and interacting and networking. Um, and so, you know, the population biology grad group, graduate group is um, covering a lot of different fields like evolution and ecology, but also genomics and modeling um, and animal behavior a little bit and other things like that. And then there are other groups that are overlapping a little bit with those. And we'll have an example comparing the ecology grad group and population biology grad group in a few slides actually. Um, so you might get some more examples at that point of kind of what the grad groups are and what they're for. Might, might wait till then. Um, a last question we have in here is, are there any limitations to be aware of when applying to grad school in science with a Bachelor of Arts rather than a Bachelor of Science, if it matters? So 
I doubt a Bachelor of Arts in biology. Um, I think the only limitation for me was that I never took physics um, and it didn't hold me back very much. I'm kind of sad that I never took physics, like not even in high school. Um, anyway, I think it doesn't matter very much. Um, you just might have a few classes you haven't taken um, that you could either take when you get there or just kind of catch up as you go along. Um, for example, I had never taken a genetics or evolution class. Um, that didn't really have much to do with whether I was doing a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Arts, but it definitely left me a little bit more behind on some things. Like when we got to the population genetics section, I was like, this is a lot. I uh, feel very in over my head, but I got through it. I had people uh, helping me out, um, but they'll, they'll tell you what your like prerequisites are when you're going into a program. It should be posted somewhere on a website or something. I think there's one question we skipped about um, the service activities. Oh. How do you get involved in those things? Um, did you find these on your own or were they required for the program? Um, I would say the vast majority of them are things you find on your own or you hear about from other graduate students. They don't tend to be required. Um, at least a lot of the grad students I know are interested in service. So they kind of seek out these opportunities. Um, the one exception I for sure know of is there are some grants for example, that might require you to have a service component. Um, so that would be one way it could be required. But most of these things are things we volunteer our time to do. Hannah, um, I have an answer really quick to, um, would you consider it worthwhile to contact a PI that says they aren't accepting um, students for 2001 since accepted students for this cycle would start in 2000, or 2022. So um, I actually had this happen where I got a response from a potential advisor that said they originally weren't planning on accepting students. Um, but in my initial email, I had explained some of my strong points. And one of those was that I had a very strong statistics background. And um, this mentor or this potential advisor contacted me back and said, well, I wasn't planning on accepting students, but because of your strong point, I might consider you. So I think that that's, it, it, it never hurts to, to put yourself out there. The worst they can say is no, and you may just find yourself in a position that's kind of an exception to what they were already thinking about doing. Great. Okay. I think um, it's time for us to move on. Hopefully everybody's back from that break. Okay. So um, this might uh, address some of those questions about graduate groups. So what are some ways in which graduate programs vary? Um, first, do you all have any ideas about this? Uh, maybe in your research? Share your thoughts in the chat. Yep, focus of topic. Size of cohort, amount of attention or structure from mentors. That might be more of a PI um, variation. Classes people might take for sure, funding. Wow, you all don't even need this presentation. <laughs> okay, I think we can move on and tell you some of the things we thought about. So programs vary in size, career emphasis, length, course structure and emphasis, and social culture, among other things. And to give you an example, um, like I said before, we're going to look at the difference between ecology and population biology, which are two graduate groups at UC Davis. And a lot of the folks who are well, everyone facilitating is in the population biology graduate group. Um, so there's a lot of variation between programs at the same school that may seem really similar in subject matter. Um, so both of these groups incorporate some ecology evolution and animal behavior into their research, but they differ in a lot of ways that will affect your experience if you belong to one or the other. So ecology has many more students, around 150 with both masters and doctoral students, um, whereas pop bio, has like 30 to 40 doctoral students only, so no master's students. Um, and in ecology, um, folks are more likely to 
study things like restoration, conservation, protection, or more applied types of biology. Whereas in population biology, students tend to have more of a basic research focus. And what we mean there is just something not necessarily as obviously applied as like conservation. Although I have seen that change a little bit more um, towards applied in, in past years um, across the board, I think. Uh, both programs are on average five to seven years. And in ecology, your first year will consist of classes that focus heavily on ecology and you'll have exams at the end of each quarter. Whereas in pop bio, you take classes on more interdisciplinary topics, like I said before, like evolution and genetics, there's be, gonna be more of a quantitative emphasis and you'll take one big exam at the end of your first year called the core exam, although that might also change um, given everything that's happened with COVID. Um, then for social culture and ecology, you're more likely to go to a dance or costume party, um, whereas in pop bio, you're more likely to find people playing board games. Um, this is an overgeneralization, but um, we joke about it. Uh, in ecology, the cohort is larger. They take classes together, but group cohesion isn't necessarily as emphasized as it, as emphasized as it is in pop bio, where you take all your classes with the four to 10 people in your cohort. You also sit in an office with them during your first year and you study for and take the core exam together. Um, and so when it comes time to choose a program, you're gonna wanna consider these different aspects and make sure it's the right fit for you because they can be quite different. There's a good question in the chat about how do you choose which program to lead towards if you have interest in multiple or if it overlaps? Yeah, so you can apply for multiple programs. You just also have to pay to apply for them. Um, so definitely look at that when you're applying because, um, for example, I applied to two different programs at University of British Columbia and because it's international, I think each one was like $120 um, to apply. Some of them are like, you know, $80 to apply to the first one and 40 to apply to the second or something like that. Um, but you can apply to both or multiple and then go and visit and kind of talk to people in each. And Hannah and I both did that for both ecology and pop bio. We um, applied to both and then visited and, and kind of did both of their recruitment weekends and decided from there. Is another question, should, be, should we be more concerned about the program group or the research in the lab of interest? Um, I think we're gonna talk more about that at a later session um, when we focus on like the lab. So I'll leave that for now, um, but feel free to continue conversation in the chat and mentors and facilitators will answer more questions. So um, talking a bit about milestones in a PhD. So there aren't very many of them, which can sometimes make it difficult to feel like you're making a lot of progress. Um, typically you take one to two years of classes and then prelims or preliminary exams. And then you finish your classes and take your qualifying exam, which is around your third year, but the timing can vary a lot. And after your QE or quals, you conduct research until it's ready to assemble into a thesis which you submit to finish your PhD. And to break down these exams a little more, in a PhD program, you're tested on both the breadth and depth components of your knowledge. So many programs have preliminary exams, which are exams on required classes, testing the breadth component of your knowledge. Um, and often these are in their first two, one to two years. Sometimes it's a set time and sometimes you get to decide. And the qualifying exam tests the depth component of your knowledge and for this, you have to defend an original research proposal consisting of three chapters or so of work you plan to publish. Um, and usually the QE is in the form of an oral exam in front of several experts in your field, which in some programs you can choose and others they're assigned to you. And before your QE, you're called a PhD student and after your QE, you're considered qualified to get a PhD and are called a PhD candidate. So that's what those titles are if you've seen them. Um, and in other programs, both the breadth and depth components are combined into comprehensive exams or comps, where you have to take tests on general knowledge and defend your proposal all at the same time. So the requirements can really vary and you should think about that when you're looking at different programs. 
So in your actual dissertation, you're going to conduct original research using your dissertation proposal as a guide. Um, you'll assess your progress with your dissertation committee at least a few times a year. And that committee is a group of experts in the fields related to your research, usually with three to five people in it. That's going to include your advisor or PI. Um, and then you'll compile your research results into three or so chapters and submit that upon which you'll either defend your thesis or give an exit seminar. Um, and in pop bio, you don't have to defend. And this is true for all UC schools. It's a little bit of an antiquated thing, but some places still do it. So when it comes time to finish your PhD, there are some incentives to finish early. Um, you might only be guaranteed funding for X number of years by your advisor, granting agencies, or the school. Um, you can also often get paid more as a professional, like a postdoc or professor or an in industry. Um, but things happen and some people take longer and it's still possible to do, but can be more challenging. Um, so your advisor could move to a different university. You could get sick, have kids, need to work a second job or take time off. And just want to emphasize that a good advisor and program will support you no matter what until you finish. Um, next, we're going to talk a bit about grad school versus like a traditional nine to five day job. Uh, I just want to clear up a few misconceptions. So grad school is not an extension of undergrad. It is not a fast track lane to academia, and it's not a nine to five or gig job. It's more focused. Um, your responsibilities as a student go beyond taking classes. And these classes are small and usually focused on reading primary literature rather than textbooks. Much of the learning is going to be experiential and outside the classroom. It's also a lot less structured and more self-motivated. Um, comparing it, grad school is not a fast track lane to academia. So just because you get a PhD doesn't mean you're guaranteed a tenure track position. Also, not everyone wants to become a professor. So you can do a lot of other things with a PhD besides academia, and it gives you a lot of soft skills that people tend to undervalue. Um, and finally, it's not the same as a nine to five or gig job. So comparing and contrasting, contrasting a PhD versus a nine to five, um, whereas in a PhD, you have a lot of control and flexibility with your time. A nine to five job has low control and flexibility. The flip side of this is that in a PhD, there is a lot of uncertainty and lack of structure. Um, so depending on your personality, this can be a great thing or a difficult thing. So self-motivation is key in a PhD. Um, in terms of the pay in a PhD, that can be really variable. I've seen as low as like $20,000 a year and as high as $40,000 a year, but generally it's going to be lower than a lot of nine to five jobs. Um, in academic culture, there can be a lot of incentive or uh, encouragement to overwork and be hyper focused, but this can quickly become unhealthy. Um, and there are definitely labs that have a much better work life balance, and it's just something to look out for when you're looking at programs and labs. And in any case, you'll want to have a conversation with your potential advisor about expectations surrounding work hours and your work schedule. Um, and with a nine to five job, it'll depend on your field, um, but the culture can be more intense or less intense. All right. Um, what we'd like you to do now is write down a couple of things that are still a little bit cloudy to you about the structure and function of grad school. Um, so if there's anything that came up in this presentation that you're like, hey, I don't really understand that or I'd like some more information about that, um, take a moment to think of those things. Okay, keep them in your head, hold them there because we're going to send you back to your breakout room. So please share those cloudy points with your breakout room. And hopefully um, the mentor or mentors that are in that room will be present to help clear some of those things up. So I think we'll do this for about 15 minutes and then we'll come back um, to do feedback and just some reminders about upcoming sessions. Um, <laughs> All right, welcome back. Hope you uh, enjoyed chatting with your breakout room. I know I really enjoyed talking to people in mine um, and don't forget, you can always reach out to your mentor um, with any questions that you have or things, you know, things that came up that you didn't get to talk about during this session. Awesome. So 
Um, we have a couple slides before we end today. First, we would appreciate if you would fill out this brief feedback form about this workshop. Uh, we'll give you a couple minutes to do this now. Um, I'm gonna post this also in the chat. That's Fern. Okay, this should be the right link. Give you another 30 seconds or so now, and then you can finish it later if you haven't now. So, we want to be respectful of your time. Okay, um, wrap up your final thought or go ahead and finish it later. Um, we move to the next slide. As a reminder, here is the calendar with the remaining sessions. Um, this is on our website if you wanna refresh your memory as well. And next I will hand it over to Danielle to talk a bit about next week's session. All right. Thanks everyone. Um, next week we are going to be leading a um, mini workshop uh, in our um, in our session uh, for applying in timeline, and we are going to be talking about how to talk about your research. So, um, for example. Um, I'm Danielle. I'm a PhD student. This is my elevator pitch. Um, and I'm at UC Davis studying evolutionary plant defenses and life history responses um, to different herbivore communities. I'm interested in how herbivores select for different defense strategies and how plant populations may respond to herbivore community shifts due to climate change. So before our next session, please go ahead and think of just a few sentences to describe yourself and then the research that you do or want to do. And it can be brief, um, it can be uh, kind of shortened to the point, um, but describing the kind of research you see yourself doing. Thanks. Okay, and again, today was just an introduction. So if you wanna dig deeper in any of these topics, there are a few options for following up. So each of you should have been assigned an individual mentor and they should have already reached out to you. So if they haven't, let us know um, and feel free to reach out to, to them as well. And we will be posting a recording of today's session on our website along with resources for each session. On our website, we also have an FAQ page with an anonymous question box. So if you have questions you'd rather su submit anonymously, feel free to do so there. You can also follow us on Twitter or contact us via email if you have any additional questions or concerns. Um, so that wraps it up for today. Thank you all so much for coming.